here in Ghana, uh, the CDD has uh, released its Apple bio Barometer report, which says that the majority of Ghanaians think that the economy is heading towards the wrong direction. The survey was carried out from September 16 to October 3, and uh, it sampled about 2,400 Ghanaians. My colleague, George Raffi, has been speaking to the director of CDD. This is a, an alphabetical question that always, I think, confounds everybody, whether Ghanaians are internal optimists. We don't know, but every time uh, they say the, they evaluate the economy as either going, uh, going the wrong direction or the country going the wrong direction, if you ask them that in the next 12 months, do they believe that things will get better, they are always positive. So that's a good thing because it means that people are not fatalistic about the uh, current situation. They expect that something good might happen. Uh, you know that with perception uh, survey, it's very difficult to dig deep into what directs. Uh, we have done analysis before to see if religion has uh, is a driver, but none of those things are proving so. So it's still for me, uh, uh, I'm always confounded by by that particular so for finding. The, for policy makers and looking at how widespread this, this survey was, what are you expecting to be their response? In terms of policy response, in terms of ensuring that they have to tweak things a little bit to ensure that confidence pick up? Because when you have confidence, yeah. then again, your response in terms of tax measures and all the rest will change. There were many uh, findings that I, uh, for me, I think it raises some interesting questions about government policy. So uh, if you get the findings on, on whether how government is doing on uh, reducing the income gap, how government is doing on uh, or, or employment, for instance, and so on, which are all uh, poor ratings, is it that government policy is yet to translate in, into sort of the, the kind of benefits that we, we expect? or? the policy design or the policy implementation itself has to be looked at again or you know I mean it's there are many things that we know government is trying to do to address you know economy issues social issues and so on why is it not being felt and is it just a question of time giving it time or we have to look at the policy themselves so these are still I think these are for me very useful debates uh, for us to have that guardians are saying okay they are not you know feeling the benefits of these things and actually if you compare between 2017 and 2019 in a two-year period whatever optimism was there has all uh, sort of reduced so there is questions that we have to ask ourselves about government policy and are we how do we measure progress because even if it's delayed can we say that we are halfway down the line and that in the next half we will be getting the benefits and what will be our metrics. My final question, so do I get from you, despite all this whole cleanup issue, there is still confidence in the banking space at least and the, the banks. banks? At least the banks. So the traditional banks? Or it is the traditional banks. So they obviously... The national, so, local it does it, so it doesn't, it, we, we didn't do that disaggregation. But the fact that in spite of the measures and so on and so forth, Compared to say savings and loans, compared to microfinance, compared to traditional susu, the banks definitely still have confidence. Now, the Vice President, Dr. Mahmoud Bamiya, has called on commercial banks in the country to focus on investing in initiatives that will promote the sustainable development goals. He indicated the world is moving towards programs that seek to promote green economies, and Ghana cannot be left out. The Vice President was speaking during the launch of a uh, sustainable banking principles and sector guidelines for banks in the country. There have been calls for financial institutions to support government's initiative to eliminate the risk of climate change. The Bank of Ghana's document on the sustainable environment for banks is aimed at guiding financial institutions in funding infrastructural projects that will preserve the environment. According to the Vice President, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, Ghana cannot be left out in the global drive towards a green economy. It is clear that a lot of work has taken place. This has been a lot of work uh, and, and we are now being aligned to the global standards uh, so that Ghana is, because as you can see, 
of, I mean, the thinking now is about climate change. That is the thinking. And money is only going to move to places which take climate change into account and sustainable banking principles into account. So if you are outside the loop, uh, you will soon be uh, basically sidelined. And uh, we cannot be outside the loop. This is why this is so, so important. To be revealed that crisis related to climate change can affect financial stability. There is no doubt that environmental risk and risk arising from climate change in particular constitutes a significant systemic risk for the financial sector. Such fundamental changes in the environment could affect economic and financial stability and the safety and soundness of financial firms with clear potential implications for central banks. Governor of the Central Bank, Dr. Ennis Addison, spoke on the importance of the guidelines. Responsible banking practices will have to ensure that environmental and social risks associated with projects financed by banks are well managed. For banks to remain sustainable over the long term, it is important that their own internal operations and financing activities meet the present needs of economic agents today, while not compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. The Bank of Ghana, therefore, recognizes environmental and social risk management as key components of banks' overall risk management strategy. The Ghana Bankers Association declared its support for the initiative. Eben Sabote's report for Joy Business. Meanwhile, President of the Ghana Association of Bankers, Al Hassan and Dani, has some uh, more about the reforms. For us, it's just to try and get the Bank of Ghana to help us drive further efficiencies into the banking sector. Yes, we have had some cleanup. So once we've cleaned up, how do we work to ensure that we are actually deploying uh, risk funds in a manner that is going to support the economy? You know, and we will talk about some of the capital requirements directives because there's one thing, there's one thing, uh, you know, uh, cleaning up. Then another thing, when you have tightened up the capital controls in such a way that the banks are unable to release enough or have enough capital to support the risk book. So we'll be, we'll be having conversations around what we call the capital, I mean the capital risk requirements directives, which, which is to manage the overall risk book. And, and also, as I said, generally, we will want to be driving efficiencies. See the Bank of Ghana to help us drive efficiencies through the banking system. How committed is the Bankers Association to this whole push? One, the bit about the reserves that you're supposed to give out to small businesses. Some are saying that, listen, as a bank, allow me, I will determine where I want to lend, depending on my book. No, let's be clear, in terms of re reducing the reserving requirement, the banks, bank, I mean, the Ghana Social Bankers have been talking to the Bank of Ghana over the last two years. So it's, it's, a, it's a move in the right direction. It releases more funds for us to continue to do what we are doing. Already we are lending to SMEs, but the 2% two, two release on the capital will just enhance what we are doing. So it's not just the two billion that will be uh, available for SMEs. It will only augment what we've already been doing. You know, and we will be looking at other industry cleanup measures that will make it, you know, because what you want is quality assets. When you make out loans, you want the loans to be repaid so that you can revolve it to another person. So we'll be working with the courts, we'll be working with all sorts of structures and the Lands Commission to ensure that we can have a much more robust credit environment. Now, Finance Minister Ken Ophiata has called on the private sector to support small and medium-scale enterprises to help meet various sustainable development goals. The minister says this will complement government's efforts in closing the SDG financing gap estimated to be at $3 trillion. He was speaking at the second edition of the Accra SDGs Investment Fair. For the 2019 Accra Investment Fair, Sustainable Development Financing, Building Mutually Beneficial Partnerships, was chosen because the Ministry of Finance recognizes the importance of collaborations between private and public actors in economic development. The SDGs are a collection of 17 global goals designed to be a blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. Speaking at the opening ceremony of the fair, Finance Minister Ken Oforiata noted the importance of private sector as a support for government's goal to reach the SDGs. Tackling 
illicit financial flows and uh, base erosion and profit sharing, which results in some $70 billion a year um, from Africa. I therefore encourage both local and foreign businesses and financial institutions to support the financing of the SDGs by directly partnering with government and also by injecting funds into private sector projects and businesses that have the potential to bring shared values and by leading in the discussions um, to slay these elephants, this global financial architecture uh, which disadvantage the countries in the South. Meanwhile, Minister for Planning, Professor Jan Balfour, speaking on behalf of President Zekufado, also stressed on the importance of job creation as an essential tool for development. As we move towards developing our infrastructure and strengthening our manufacturing sectors, we are guided by the fact that digitalization will, imp will impact greatly on how we produce, on how we trade, and source the needed financing to expand our industries. The skill set demanded from our workforce tomorrow and in the future will be different from those today. That is why public-private collaborations will be essential in equipping the next generation with the requisite tool set that they need and will need, we will need to compete in future job markets. So as governments across the world are working at closing the SDG financing gap, which stands around $2.5 to $3 trillion, Ghana is looking at using this fair as one of the ways to help raise investments for businesses that are geared towards the SDG goals. But then there have also been concerns that the private sector should not be solely depended upon as a solution for generating investments for these businesses. Reporting here from Kempiski in Accra, Karen Dodu for Joy Business. CEO of the Telecoms Chamber, Ken Ashibe, is warning government imposing a tax on the mobile money sector will collapse the young industry. Taxing mobile money is one of the options government is considering to raise revenue for budgetary purposes. About 15.1 million from the mobile financial services, you know, in 2018. So there's taxes that has already paid. If any of the mobile financial services make a profit, they will pay tax on it, you know, at 30%. That's the CIT rate. And then for every agent who is paid a commission, there's some withholding tax, so tax is withheld because of the service, they've rendered service, and so tax is withheld, and that is paid to government. The, when our mo uh, the mobile financial companies work with any entity, any supplier that supplies anything, withholding taxes are paid. So that 15.1 million for last year, it's coming from that particular angle. Now, when we, so if anybody wants to look at taxation beyond that, then it will be taxation of the transactions. But you should remember that in 2017, when the MPP came into government, they looked at financial services, banking financial services, and decided that the VAT that was on it was, was a nuisance tax. So You're watching uh, Business Live. Now, if you've tried boarding a trotro, that is a commercial uh, transport service here in Ghana, uh, it's quite a hassle, but some startup is making it easier for uh, passengers to be able to board vehicles without stress. We want to tell you next about Starbus on this episode of the Joy Business Van. Accra is fast growing and rapid expansion has exposed poor transport infrastructure. Traveling by road is the most popular mode of transport. Commercial buses or trotros, we usually call them, are the most patronized, but getting to board one can be quite a task. You may have to join long queues or literally engage in a struggle for a seat during rush hours. If you're lucky, you may get a bus in good shape. Otherwise, prepare for a bumpy ride in a rickety vehicle. But that is just a bit of the trotro experience. I think that the best way to, dis to discover a city um, is through its public, trans its public transport system. You know, when you travel to other places, 
um, with more advanced public transportation system. You discover the beauty of the city. You are marveled by the things you see. Um, but it's not the case in, in, in most part of Africa. It, it's just not, it, the fact that we don't have a good transport system doesn't only impact on the beauty of the city, it also has huge economic impact on the country. Salapa Isidore Potofi thought about these challenges and discovered a solution. Create a pool of private buses and a system that enables passengers access the service. The way it works is that the passenger will have to specify that I, I'm picking the bus from this station. I want to be picked up at this particular location and I want to be dropped off at this location. Then our system automatically sends this request to the network of buses. Then the network dispatches the bus to where the, the demand is or to where the customer or the passenger has, has requested the bus from. And the bus then picks the passenger at their specific pickup location and drop them off at their drop off location. All you have to do, book your seat 24 hours in advance with the Starbus mobile app or via WhatsApp and pick the bus at your selected pickup location. Let's give it a try. Okay, so um, there are, this, this is the bus, wow. uh, one of the buses. Um, Starbus. Yes, as you can see, it, uh, it, it's, it's very neat. It's well air conditioned as well. Please get in. All right, to I'll tell you. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, um, how do you determine the routes you use? Um... Uh, so, we have two, two ways to do that. The first is based on demand. Okay. So, the passengers will have to request for the ride 24 hours in advance. So, we deploy the buses to where um, the demands are high. And the second is also based on uh, where our partners, our bus partners, are likely to make more money. Okay. So, these are the two mechanisms you use to determine. Nice. Starbus has been on the road for a couple of weeks and has about 25 passengers a day. What kind of feedback do you get from people? who use your bus. <laughs> it is impressive. I, I know it's supposed to be like the trotro, but this is more like an yeah. upgraded form of yeah, trotro. It's, it's very impressive. An AC yeah. and all of that. We are, we are under pressure to, to deploy to more routes, uh, and which we don't have the capacity to do now. Um, the passengers are really wow. They are very marveled that such a fan or such a service would exist in, in Accra, mm. because they are very used to trotro. Um, <laughs> not neat, but you know, passenger service, uh, not AC, you know, so... I'm enjoying this. <laughs> thank you. So that, these are the kinds of feedback we receive from passengers. Passengers pay slightly more than their typical trotter fares, but of course, they get added value. Uh, what are some of the challenges you've encountered? Um, the, the, the first challenge is the supply. Supply is very limited, so we don't have uh, many buses to meet the demand, that one. And then second is the drop-off, the drop-off and pick-up. People want to be picked up, you know, at their, own at, convenience. At, they at their own convenience in their house. Um, people don't also follow the time, the timing. And it's and a, so, a typical Ghanaian. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's challenging. So you have to um, make it possible for the for the driver and the passenger to communicate, to communicate constantly so that there's that, that, um, that convenience and ease of access for the service. With the level of interest shown so far, Isidore's headache now is to increase the pool of buses. We want to build a, a complete end-to-end -end bus transportation you know, infrastructure, technology infrastructure, in the sense that we want to have a, a technology that can enable people, or that, that enables people to, to, pick, to book a bus ride in, in intra-city and also to be able to you know, book a bus ride from a city and not one city to another. But, and ultimately we want to become a unicorn. We want to become an African unicorn in the sense that we are valued that more than the billion or I mean the billion dollar company. Uh, yeah, so it's, <laughs> that's a target for us. Great vision. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. And thanks for the ride. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> And that's Business Live tonight. Thanks for watching.